What's the best Australian movie ever made? If you're a fan of the post-apocalypse, your answer might just be Mad Max, director George Miller's marauding motorist mania, celebrating its 45th anniversary in 2024. Never mind the billion-dollar franchise it spawned and the countless genre stories it influenced, the creative ingenuity and low-budget DIY filmmaking of the 1979 original makes the movie one of the most impressive feats in cinematic history. A true independent movie with a rebellious spirit, Mad Max was made in just 12 weeks for a few hundred thousand dollars and went on to generate record profits. And it introduced the world to a young Mel Gibson who would go on to become a bona fide Hollywood action star. As the legacy of the wasteland continues with Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, it's a good time to check the rearview mirror and look back at what the fuck happened to Mad Max. People don't believe in heroes anymore. I know, McAfee, you want to give them back their heroes. Mad Max was George Miller's feature-length film debut following his time working as an emergency room doctor in Sydney, Australia. Miller grew up in rural Queensland and experienced the loss of several close friends dying in violent motorcycle collisions. And during his days working in the ER, he often witnessed the types of fatal road injuries seen in Mad Max. In 1971, Miller enrolled in film school and met fellow filmmaker Byron Kennedy, who would go on to share screenwriting credit with Miller for Mad Max. The duo made a short film titled Violence in Cinema Part 1, which proved to be a semi-blueprint for Mad Max. Miller also hired newspaper editor James McCausland to flesh out the script. Despite making his first feature, Miller had a clear vision to create a visceral, hyperkinetic, silent movie with sound, inspired by the storytelling techniques introduced by silent film pioneers like Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd. With zero screenplay experience, Miller focused on the action scenes and overall structure, while McCausland concentrated on dialogue and subtext, using the 1973 Australian oil crisis as inspiration for the movie's crumbling society. Miller also found inspiration in the 1975 Don Johnson post-apocalyptic movie A Boy and His Dog, based on a Harlan Ellison story. However, Miller later admitted that the movie's dystopian atmosphere was not part of the original screenplay, but was born out of necessity. Due to the small budget, Miller could not afford many extras or well-maintained buildings, so instead he opted to place the story in a desolate and deteriorating civilization, with the opening title card implying it occurs after a world war or other catastrophe. Miller and McCausland presented a 40-page treatment to the Australian government, which funded most of the film. They also raised money by performing medical house calls, with the former treating patients and the latter driving. The filmmakers ultimately raised around $400,000 to make Mad Max. When the time for casting approached, Miller considered choosing an American to play Max Rokotansky in an effort to broaden the movie's appeal. After venturing to Hollywood to recruit, Miller backtracked when realizing that a recognizable American actor would be too costly. By design, Miller hired unknown actors to play roles, so viewers would not be distracted by familiar faces from previous projects. The first choice to play Mad Max was Irish actor James Healy, who rejected the script due to its sparse dialogue. Once Healy declined, the casting director considered new grad students from Australia's National Institute of Dramatic Art, searching for spunky young guys to play various roles. 21-year-old American-born actor Mel Gibson wowed the filmmakers during his audition and was cast as Max Rokotansky while still a drama student, earning $15,000 for his performance. Meanwhile, Gibson's friend and school roommate Steve Bisley, who had encouraged Gibson to audition for the film, was cast as Max's affable MFP colleague Jim Goose. Miller had also been inspired by the 1974 biker exploitation movie Stone and hired several actors from the movie, including Vincent Gill, Roger Ward, and the menacing toe cutter himself, Hugh Keyes Byrne, who went full method for the role, shaving an eyebrow and patterning his performance on conqueror Genghis Khan. Of course, while the toe cutter meets a messy fate, Keyes Byrne would later reunite with Miller to play Fury Road's imposing tyrant, Immortan Joe. Principal photography on Mad Max began in November of 1977, originally planned for a 10-week shoot but extending to 12. Unfortunately, just four days into filming, actress Rosie Bailey was injured in an accident and was replaced after a two-week production delay by Joanne Samuel as Max's wife, Jessie. The majority of the film was shot in the outback around Melbourne in Victoria. Miller chose to film Mad Max in a widescreen anamorphic format, shooting the entire movie using a 35mm lens that had been discarded by director Sam Peckinpah for his 1972 film The Getaway. A labor of love in every sense, Mad Max reflects the manic anti-authoritarian energy of the production techniques themselves. Described by Miller as true guerrilla filmmaking, shots were flat out stolen by mounting cameras to the tops of cars, closing roads without legal permits, and capturing footage in areas forbidden by the authorities. 
For example, the first scene filmed involved actor Tim Burns, who plays impetuous gang member Johnny the Boy, busting the chain on a locked emergency phone. Burns appears rushed because Miller lacked the legal permission to film the scene and raced to capture the footage before the actual bronze could arrive. The death-defying filmmaking methods perfectly embody the spirit of the movie, with driving scenes captured at full terrifying speeds and typically performed by the cast themselves. Cinematographer David Egby would shoot while laying on the hood of an accelerating car or sitting on the back of a motorcycle without a helmet while the vehicle rocketed across the asphalt at over 100 miles an hour. Before we continue with our video, here's a reminder to click the Store tab on any of our Joe Blow channels and browse our collection of the latest and freshest designs in our merch store. Go get you some. Miller and his crew avoided using walkie-talkies in order to remain undetected by police scanners, and they often cleared road wreckages by themselves after filming crash scenes. Ironically, Miller's attempts to avoid the authorities backfired when the actual local police became interested in the production and assisted the filmmakers by escorting vehicles and shutting down roads to accommodate the filming. As a first-time filmmaker with a restricted budget, Miller unsurprisingly faced numerous problems early on, even getting so bad that he quit the project. Producer and co-writer Byron Kennedy then asked fellow Aussie filmmaker Brian Trenchard Smith if he would take over directing duties, but Trenchard Smith instead advised them to hire a talented first assistant director. Miller forged ahead and completed the film with Ian Goddard stepping in as first AD and safety coordinator. To Goddard's credit, for such a brazenly renegade production, no road accidents occurred while filming. That doesn't mean there weren't several intentional crashes, with 14 vehicles deliberately destroyed for the crash and chase sequences by the end of filming, including several of the motorcycles donated by a local Kawasaki dealer who had actually expected to get them back in working condition. For the blue van in the opening pursuit scene, the engine was removed, and the vehicle weighed so little that it chaotically spun out of control on impact, accentuating the explosive spectacle. For gearheads especially, it's hard to discuss Mad Max without mentioning the killer cars seen on screen. The police cars in the film are actual decommissioned police vehicles that were more affordable than the alternative. Max's yellow Interceptor was a former Victoria police car, a tuned-up 1974 Ford Falcon XB. One interesting detail is the name of Rokotansky's unseen road partner, the Dark One, stamped on the side of the Interceptor. And while the character was cut from the movie, he's briefly referenced by Max, and is supposedly who Goose is gruesomely describing in the opening diner scene. Sitting there trying to scream with his face ripped off. Max's black V8 Pursuit Special was a 1973 Ford XB Falcon GT351, a limited edition hardtop model discontinued in 1976. These badass road burners are among the most iconic movie cars ever constructed and helped popularize Mad Max when it raced into theaters. Knight Rider's infamous death crash was filmed using a military-grade booster rocket installed in the back of a tricked-out 1972 Holden Monaro. The car was meant to collide with a trailer of fuel barrels, but instead it sped out of control and flew off the road, zooming into a nearby field for a quarter mile. The graphic explosion of Knight Rider's demise was filmed separately using a towed car under safer conditions. One memorable scene involves Jim Goose giving a three-wheeled cyclist a get-out-of-jail-free card, which was a sly in-joke among Miller and his cast and crew. Several of Toecutter's gang were actual members of the Vigilantes, a Melbourne motorcycle club. Because of their authentic appearance, the real-life bikers were often discriminated against and treated poorly in town. Since the gang members drove themselves to the set each day, as a precaution, Miller gave them each written letters to present to police officers in case they were pulled over, literal get-out-of-jail-free cards. The small budget and lack of resources necessitated all kinds of cost-cutting measures. For instance, no stunt doubles were used during the physical scuffles, and the actors performed the fights themselves. May's rural home was an abandoned farmhouse that had to be furnished by the filmmakers with their personally owned items. For the costumes, only Mel Gibson wore genuine leather, with other cast appearing in much cheaper vinyl outfits. And when Max handcuffs Johnny the Boy in the famous final scene, plastic toy cuffs were used, despite Max claiming they're made out of high tensile steel. Johnny's grim predicament would later inspire fellow Aussies James Wan and Lee Whannell for the ghastly climax of their horror debut, Saw. Once principal photography wrapped, Miller and Kennedy edited the film over four months in their friend's apartment in North Melbourne, actually cutting the film on a homemade editing machine that Kennedy's father engineered for them. Another unforgettable part of Mad Max is the gothic musical score, arranged by Australian composer Brian May, not to be confused with the Queen guitarist. Miller instructed May to create an ominous Bernard Herrmann-style score, reminiscent of classic Hitchcock movies. Miller had become a fan of May after hearing the score for the 1978 Aussie horror movie Patrick. 
Mad Max was initially banned in New Zealand due to the scene where Goose was burned in his vehicle, which unfortunately mirrored an actual recent gang incident in the country. When the movie was prepared for release in the US, all the dialogue was dubbed over by American actors because the distributor feared that the original Australian accents would be too difficult to understand for American audiences. Fortunately, the original audio was later restored for DVD releases. With its high octane action and astonishing stunts, Mad Max was a smash success in theaters, grossing over $100 million and setting a Guinness World Record for the most profitable film in 1979, a title it retained for two decades until getting dethroned by low-budget phenomenon The Blair Witch Project in 1999. The success of George Miller's primal revenge thriller launched his illustrious directing career, helped propel star Mel Gibson to the A-list, and put Australia on the map as a cinematic power player. But the enduring legacy of Mad Max and its sequels has been the undeniable influence on the vibe and aesthetic of countless futuristic societies that followed, with motorhead madmen, tactical fetish gear, barren planes, and adrenaline fury all becoming synonymous with stories set in the post-apocalypse. And thankfully for fans of jaw-dropping road action and outrageous characters, George Miller continues his Mad Max saga in 2024 with Furiosa, chronicling the early days of Fury Road's fierce Imperator. Even after 45 years, Miller is not willing to leave the wasteland behind, and we're grateful that our fuel tanks have been filled by his unique vision of the end of the world. Before we continue with our video, here's a reminder to click the store tab on any of our Joe Blow channels and browse our collection of the latest and freshest designs in our merch store. Go get you some. Bigger, better, faster, more. The first sequel to any popular genre movie tends to follow that very simple checklist, and not many successfully ticked all those boxes quite like Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior. Released two years after the handcrafted, low-budget original Mad Max raced onto screens in 1979, The Road Warrior was a different experience for visionary filmmaker George Miller than his first go-around. No longer hampered by limited resources and budgetary restrictions, Miller was able to execute more dazzling, audacious set pieces and action sequences that eluded him in the first film. Despite the financial leeway that gave Miller creative freedom, making The Road Warrior was still not a smoothly paved escapade. We're not just here for the gasoline, we're about to find out what the f**k happened to this movie. Following the massive record-setting success of Mad Max upon its release in 1979, Writer-director George Miller was flooded with a slew of Hollywood offers, including the Sylvester Stallone classic First Blood. But Miller turned down the Rambo movie to instead make a rock and roll musical titled Roxanne, possibly after the hit song by the police. And he reunited with writer Terry Hayes after they collaborated on the novelization of Mad Max. But the script for the rock project was put on the back burner while Miller and Hayes redirected their focus on a Mad Max sequel. Miller felt that making another Max with more money would allow him to achieve what he could not the first time, where he felt that he ultimately had no control over the final product. While the first Mad Max was partially inspired by silent Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd movies, The Road Warrior was influenced by the work of filmmaker Akira Kurosawa, psychoanalyst Carl Jung, and Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, along with the hyperviolence of Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. The story also parallels the classic western Shane, as seen through Max's relationship with the feral kid. Miller, Hayes, and co-writer Brian Hannant fleshed out the screenplay, with Hannant also serving as first AD and second unit director. Mad Max 2 was fueled up with a four and a half million dollar budget, more than ten times what Miller had to work with on the original Mad Max, making the sequel the most expensive Australian movie production when it was made in 1981, and therefore a risky investment at the time. Miller claims the sequel was written and released within one calendar year, which would certainly be a far shorter journey than the long and winding Fury Road, which took 12 years from script to theaters. Miller's second trip in the post-apocalypse took 12 weeks to complete principal photography, around the same time as the original. Looking at the expanded scope of the sequel, it's hard to believe The Road Warrior was made as fast and furiously as its predecessor. Despite the hot, sweaty appearance of the sun-scorched wasteland, The Road Warrior was filmed during the Australian winter and was extremely cold. Returning star Mel Gibson would bundle up beneath blankets as soon as his scenes were filmed, despite wearing a leather outfit. The bikers wearing assless chaps also suffered from the extreme temperature. Vernon Wells, who plays mohawked marauder Wes, was given the nickname Barometer Bum by Gibson due to his backside constantly turning purple in the frigid conditions. The filming location of Australia's Broken Hill was also chosen based on weather forecasts, which predicted very little rainfall. 
However, the production had to be shut down for one whole week when it began downpouring for the first time in four years. The Road Warrior was also shot almost entirely in sequence, a rarity for an action movie. For his director of photography, Miller hired Dean Semler, who would later return to the area in 1984 to film Russell Mulcahy's landmark Australian creature feature, Razorback. Miller was so gung-ho about capturing visceral footage that he initially dressed in costume and controlled a car-mounted camera rig from inside a vehicle. But Miller flubbed the timing on the first take and was immediately replaced with a camera operator. Miller and Semler also utilized steel-reinforced remote-controlled cameras called Ned Kellys, named for the impenetrable armor worn by the infamous Aussie outlaw. While Max Rokotansky's relationship with his Australian cattle dog makes for some memorable movie moments, the dog was actually found at a nearby pound just one day before he was scheduled to be euthanized. The dog was quickly trained to perform for the movie and was fitted with special earplugs to stifle the loud car engines. Unlike their on-screen interactions, the dog also got along quite well with actor Bruce Spence, who plays the excitable comic relief Gyro Captain. And while life can be harsh in the wasteland, the dog himself had a happy ending, getting adopted by a camera operator after filming Wrapped. Thanks to the extended budget, the oil refinery settlement marked the most expensive set ever built for an Australian movie. Appropriately, the detonation of the refinery during the climax was also the biggest explosion in the history of Australian cinema at the time. Done under the supervision of the Australian Army, the blast was so gigantic that airlines had to be notified beforehand. The movie's imposing antagonist, Lord Humongous, The Ayatollah of Rock and Roller! was originally envisioned to be Jim Goose, Max's charred partner from the first film. Although some clues, like his MFP police minions, seem to indicate this linkage, Miller later stated the character had been a military man who may have served with settlement leader Papa Gallo, a possible connection that deepens the villain's frustration with the refinery's resistance. The grungy leather-clad costumes worn by most of the marauders were inspired by S&M attire. Much of the clothing was found at local thrift shops, junk stores, sporting outlets, and garage sales. As for Max's rough appearance, it was largely Mel Gibson's idea to grow stubble and shaggy hair and rip his jacket sleeve and gloves to give Max a more rugged and uncivilized look. Gibson also only speaks 16 lines of dialogue in the entire film, including the mission statement, I'm just here for the gasoline. Max's V8 interceptor is the same car Gibson drove in the original film. After Mad Max wrapped production, the vehicles were intended to be destroyed, but the V8 Interceptor was deemed too iconic to scrap. Once Mad Max 2 was announced, the Interceptor was tracked down and recycled for the sequel. The original model of Pursuit Special, a 1973 Ford XB Falcon GT351, was modified for the sequel for interior close-ups of Max driving inside the vehicle, and a second was utilized for chase sequences and was deliberately destroyed for Max's attempted escape from the Marauders. Much like the original Mad Max, The Road Warrior holds up thanks to incredible practical effects and genuinely death-defying stunt work. The film features more than 200 stunts, and over 80 custom vehicles were utilized during the production, with roughly half of them demolished by the end of filming. Before we continue with our video, here's a reminder to click the Store tab on any of our Joe Blow channels and browse our collection of the latest and freshest designs in our merch store. Go get you some. Miller would occasionally drop frames to increase the sense of velocity, but for the most part, the vehicles were all filmed at speed. Clever framing was also used for road scenes where no movement would be seen in the background, capturing those shots while the vehicles were stationary. One of the most notorious vehicular mishaps occurred when a motorcycling marauder somersaults through the air during the final tanker chase. Due to a miscalculation, stunt performer Guy Norris nearly lost his life when he crashed and shattered his leg on impact, which is the shot used in the final film. The injury and brush with death didn't discourage Norris, who reunited with Miller on several occasions to act as stunt coordinator, including on Fury Road and Furiosa. When shooting the oil tanker scenes, Mel Gibson had to be replaced with a stunt driver because he did not know how to operate the manual quad box transmission. The stunt driver would accelerate the vehicle, then duck out of the camera's view and allow Gibson to slip into frame to get his medium and close-up shots. For the final tanker crash, the scene was considered so potentially treacherous that the stunt driver was ordered not to eat any food for 12 hours before filming in case he needed to be rushed into emergency surgery. For the shot of the mangled Max being airlifted on the gyrocopter, Gibson was flat on a plank extended out of a helicopter door. Dean Semler would later note that if the shot were filmed today, it would be done with digital assistance, like parts of Fury Road and Furiosa. 
While the gyrocopter itself was an actual working air vehicle, the filmmakers inevitably accepted its limitations, and a climactic scene in the script where the gyro captain would pick up the feral kid from the speeding tanker was cut due to safety concerns. Miller also made use of the locals while making Mad Max 2. Wes's motorcycle wheelie during the opening was performed by a Broken Hill resident with his girlfriend on the back, and not a dummy as fans have long speculated. The feral kid's backflip was actually performed by a local female gymnast, and those two captives strapped to the front of Humongous's speeding truck during the chase, well, no, those were just dummies, or what Semler called watermelons with wigs. Of course, not all Broken Hill residents were interested in the production. The local postal carrier interrupted the filming of the suspenseful chase finale by casually ignoring the road blockades in order to deliver the day's mail. As for the feral kid, a long circulating fan theory had suggested that he grows up to be Tom Hardy's Max in Fury Road. However, Miller has refuted this rumor, stating that he views the movies as a series of legends and doesn't get overly concerned with continuity. He was, however, inspired by the feral kid's story to make a Lord of the Flies type of movie about lawless children in the wild. He would then get the idea to have Max chaperone the kids and guide them towards salvation, and Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome was born. Mad Max 2 opened in Australia in December of 1981, before rolling out to the rest of the world during 1982, getting retitled to The Road Warrior in North America after the first movie didn't make quite the same impact as its international performance. The sequel earned a respectable $36 million and received acclaim for its jaw-dropping action and imaginative vision of the post-apocalypse, a style and setting that would influence countless creators that followed. Steven Spielberg was so impressed with The Road Warrior that he invited Miller to direct Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, arguably the best segment of Twilight Zone the movie. James Cameron has also stated his affinity for Mad Max 2 and has cited the movie as an inspiration for The Terminator and T2. Mad Max 2 The Road Warrior still kicks ass today, due to its unwavering authenticity with real cars, real crashes, and real explosions, and no green screen or digital augmentation. Thanks to the movie's narration, we know that the feral kid and his clan made it to the northern paradise, but filmmaker George Miller would inhabit the wasteland for 45 years and 5 movies, so far. Let's hope he's still got more guzzoline in the tank. Before we continue with our video, here's a reminder to click the store tab on any of our Joe Blow channels and browse our collection of the latest and freshest designs in our merch store. Go get you some. Nailing the final entry of a classic cinematic trilogy is always the most difficult to get right. Tasked with sticking the landing and tying the narrative strands across three movies together requires a precise amount of pre-planning that must be executed in ways that both trump its predecessors and satisfy fans at once with a compelling conclusion. Every once in a while, we get perfect trilogy enders like The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, The Return of the King, or The Last Crusade. But more often than not, we get limp and lackluster results like The Godfather Part 3, Jaws 3D, Terminator Rise of the Machines, Alien 3, Back to the Future 3, Men in Black 3, and countless other movies that fail to live up to the first two installments. That begs the question, where does Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome register on the scale of all-time good or bad final chapters in movie trilogies? Released four years after The Road Warrior, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome was made much differently than the first two films. For instance, Beyond Thunderdome is the first Mad Max movie made without instrumental producer Byron Kennedy, who tragically died in a 1983 helicopter crash. It's also the only franchise entry to be co-directed by someone other than Miller. In this case, Miller hired his friend and previous collaborator, George Ogilvie, to helm the sequel. While there are plenty more cool tidbits and trivial factoids about the making of the movie, it's hard to overstate the absence of Byron and the split directorial duties that led to what many believe is the worst Mad Max movie thus far. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying time is here as we lift the hood and find out WTF happened to Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. Before we continue with our video, here's a reminder to click the store tab on any of our Joe Blow channels and browse our collection of the latest and freshest designs in our merch store. Go get you some. The first thing to know about Beyond Thunderdome is that it was not initially conceived as a Mad Max movie. 
Miller always felt that Max Rokotansky's story ended with The Road Warrior and set out to make an apocalyptic Lord of the Flies type of movie as a follow-up. Yet, once Miller got the idea to have an adult find the feral children in the wild and lead them towards salvation, the idea for Beyond Thunderdome was born. Unfortunately, producer Byron Kennedy, whose invaluable contributions to the first two films live in infamy, could not work on Beyond Thunderdome. On July 17, 1983, Byron died when a helicopter he was piloting crashed at Warragamba Dam in New South Wales, Australia. He was only 33 when he died. That Byron produced the first two Mad Max movies at age 29 and 31 is truly special and should not be understated. As one might imagine, Byron's death deeply affected Miller, who thought he could no longer continue the franchise without him. According to Miller, quote, I was reluctant to go ahead. And then there was a sort of need to, let's do something just to get over the shock and grief of all of that, end quote. To compensate for the sudden absence of his longtime producing partner, Miller hired George Ogilvy to co-direct Beyond Thunderdome. Miller and Ogilvy worked together on the 1983 Australian miniseries, The Dismissal. About the decision to co-direct the film, Miller stated, quote, I had a lot on my plate. I asked my friend George Ogilvy, who was working on the miniseries, could you come and help me? But I don't remember the experience because I was doing it to just, you know, I was grieving, end quote. Part of the collaboration process between Miller and Ogilvy included a rehearsal workshop period before filming occurred. This was most invaluable for the child actors, who spent two months training how to hunt, climb, and wield makeshift weapons. Oddly enough, Miller was attached to direct the movie Contact, but was granted the rights to The Road Warrior and Beyond Thunderdome in exchange for walking away from the sci-fi spectacle ultimately directed by Robert Zemeckis. Written by Miller and Terry Hayes, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome takes place 20 years after events depicted in the original Mad Max. Partially inspired by the sobering historical documentary The Atomic Cafe, Beyond Thunderdome was the most expensive Australian movie made up to then, breaking a record previously held by The Road Warrior. The original Mad Max cost roughly $400,000, the Road Warrior cost $4.5 million, and Beyond Thunderdome boasted a budget of $10 million. One of the reasons Miller cast American pop star Tina Turner was because Beyond Thunderdome was the first film to receive funding from the US. Of course, Turner's rousing anthem, We Don't Need Another Hero, became an international radio charting hit. The role of Auntie Entity was written specifically for Turner, before she was asked to play the part. When Turner arrived on set, she was surprised to learn that the production vehicles had manual transmissions. Turner could not drive a stick and was given a custom-made car with an automatic engine for her to drive in the film. Meanwhile, the kick-ass hairdo she sports in the movie is a wig. Turner had to shave her head before filming to fit in the wig, which she was more than willing to do. Miller also had to coax Mel Gibson to play Max again after the actor had sworn off the part after The Road Warrior. Yet, one of the strangest bits of casting involves Bruce Spence, who played the gyro captain in The Road Warrior. Spence plays the flying bandit Jedediah in Beyond Thunderdome, a similar but different character than the gyro captain. Rather than the gyrocopter, Jedediah flies a Transavia PL-12 air truck a single-motor biplane first flown in 1965 for agricultural use. At the time, only 120 air truck models were produced. According to Spence about his casting, quote, They were well into the shoot when they offered me a part described as not the gyro captain, but kind of like the gyro captain. They said there's kind of a reflection of him and that they were having difficulty casting the role, so they thought to themselves, why not Bruce? End quote. Armed with a $10 million budget, principal photography on Beyond Thunderdome began on September 10, 1984. To keep the project secret, the film's working title was Desert World. Director of photography Dean Simler returned for duty following his work on The Road Warrior, 
who claimed Beyond Thunderdome was much harder to film than its predecessor. The main reason for the increased difficulty came from the varied locations throughout Australia and to create unique visual aesthetics for each distinct environment Max encounters. For instance, most of the exterior scenes were filmed in the mining town of Cooper Petty, South Australia. Meanwhile, the children's campground was filmed in Mermaid's Cave in the Blue Mountains in South New Wales. The bustling barter town was filmed on a set built in an abandoned brick factory called The Brick Pit in Homebush Bay in Western Sydney. Gao told reporters that the background extras in Barter Town were not actors and their goth, punk appearances and attitudes were authentic. Although rumors persisted that Miller only directed the action scenes, leaving the rest of the film to be done by Ogilvy, Miller refuted such and blamed the confusion on a poorly worded press release. According to Miller, the only time he and Ogilvy split up while making Beyond Thunderdome involved the camel scenes. Otherwise, the two made the movie together every step of the way. While the making of Beyond Thunderdome didn't experience as many tragic fatalities or grave injuries as the first two films, at least one notable mishap occurred. For example, the train crashing into the car with Iron Bar Bassey on board didn't go as planned. The stunt was coordinated by Dennis Williams, the same performer who flipped the Mack truck in The Road Warrior. After delaying the stunt to accommodate the passing of an operational train, Williams performed the crash, sustained burns on his left arm and shoulder, and had to be taken to a nearby hospital to treat his wounds. One of the movie's most memorable moments comes at the end, when Max helps the children flee as a sandstorm savages the land. Like most of Mad Max's timeless sequences, the sandstorm was 100% real. In addition to the camera plane deliberately flying into the storm to capture raw footage, the crew members had to brave the storm by hiding in cars, taking safe cover nearby. Unlike the CGI-heavy 21st century Mad Max films, the tactical and practical stunts and FX work are why the film remains so durable 40 years later. Nowadays, CGI pigs would be used for the underworld scene. When making Beyond Thunderdome, 600 real pigs were rented from a nearby farm and used for the sequence. The pigs were rented because purchasing such a large amount would have affected the local pork market. Of course, as the third franchise entry, there are several overt and covert callbacks to the first two films that fans may have missed. For instance, when Max first meets Auntie Entity, one of her men plays the saxophone a subtle nod to Max's wife Jessie in the first film. Another example includes Max's mangled left eye, which has a more dilated pupil than his right eye. This was a callback to the Road Warrior when Wes threw Max off the road, rolled his V8 pursuit special, and suffered an injury. Similarly, after sustaining a gunshot wound to his leg from Bubba Zanetti in the original film, Max sports a noticeable limp and leg brace in The Road Warrior and a residual bandage on his knee in Beyond Thunderdome. When Max wanders through Barter Town and relinquishes his weapons, eagle-eyed fans can spot Wes's wrist-held crossbow from The Road Warrior, which Max must have stripped from Wes's corpse after he was smashed by a truck. These small details add up and give the franchise's world-building a connective continuity that bolsters Max's character and ties each movie together. However, there is one confusing aspect related to Blaster's fate. Some fans have claimed that Max spares Blaster in the film because he reminds him of Benno, the autistic rancher living with May Swayze in the original Mad Max. Others believe Benno and Blaster could be the same character, despite being played by different actors. As for other obscure character connections in Beyond Thunderdome, Savannah Nix cries in horror when Finn Ku is lethally sunken by quicksand because she is his mother, a detail revealed in the movie's novelization by Joan D. Vinge. Regarding discontinuity, one of the biggest changes Beyond Thunderdome made from the first two films was the music composer. The music for Mad Max and The Road Warrior was scored by Australian musician Brian May, and no, not the Queen guitarist. For Beyond Thunderdome, Miller hired Oscar-winning composer Maurice Jar, fresh off his Academy Award victory for David Lean's A Passage to India. Hiring Jar 
led to an increase in the musical budget for the film, resulting in an epic score featuring a full orchestra and over 100 musicians. Jar turned in a massive 87-minute score, including the 25-minute Big Chase finale as Max escorts the children across the desert away from Auntie. May was understandably devastated to learn Jar replaced him as he looked forward to sonically concluding the trilogy. The grand irony is that Jar's score will not be released in its entirety until 2010 due to a rights mix-up. When Miller gave up directing Contact, he was granted the rights to the entire Mad Max franchise, unwittingly including the musical score. Part of Jar's unused score for Beyond Thunderdome can be heard in Wolfgang Peterson's Enemy Mine, released in December 1985. Meanwhile, Tina Turner's hit Thunderdome theme song, We Don't Need Another Hero, reached number one in Canada, number two in the US, and number three on the UK single charts. Another fascinating aspect of Beyond Thunderdome relates to the deleted scenes. To shorten the runtime, at least two scenes were cut. The first involved Max waking from a nightmare about his murdered wife Jessie and son Sprague. As he cries in agony, Max realizes that he is becoming like the feral marauders he pursued as a police enforcer and vows to reinstill his humanity. Although the footage no longer exists, the novelization detailed the scene further. The other deleted scene involved Max taking Gecko to the top of a dune at night, spotting the lights of Bartertown in the distance and declaring they'd reach tomorrow morrow land. A few snippets from this deleted scene are featured in the music video for we don't need another hero. Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome was released in July 1985, marking Mel Gibson's final time portraying the title character. Although the film drew mostly positive reviews, it failed to reach the critical apex of the Road Warrior. Beyond Thunderdome grossed $36 million worldwide when factoring in rental sales, the same amount as the Road Warrior. The difference is, that Beyond Thunderdome was more than twice as expensive as its predecessor, making it harder to justify the franchise's continuation on the big screen. As such, Miller considered adapting the franchise to the small screen in 1986, a factoid that may have eluded fans. In 1986, Miller considered making a Mad Max TV show starring Australian actor John Blake in the title role. Unfortunately, in December 1986, Blake suffered severe brain damage during a car accident he suffered one day after filming a movie called The Light Horseman. Blake remained paralyzed in a locked-in state until he died in 2011. While far less important, the Mad Max TV show was scrapped after Blake was injured. Of course, the lasting legacy of Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome is still felt today. Thunderdome has entered the pop lexicon to denote a chaotic Royal Rumble-style deathmatch where the loser faces a harsh penalty. Thunderdome's apocalyptic iconography has been adopted by pro wrestling and recycled in such popular music videos as Tupac and Dr. Dre's California Love. The Fallout video game franchise has cited the Mad Max franchise as a major influence, and shows like Eastbound and Down and Rick and Morty have overtly parodied Beyond Thunderdome. Name of the game, kids, Thunderdome. Two men enter. One man leaves. After the movie's release, the vehicles featured in Beyond Thunderdome toured various car shows in Australia in 1985. While the writers considered killing Max Rokotansky in Beyond Thunderdome, the character's spirit died a bit when Mel Gibson portrayed the character for the final time. Meanwhile, Auntie Entity is the only female antagonist in the Mad Max franchise thus far, and the only villain to survive the original trilogy. The gender reversal has paved the way for Fury Road and Furiosa to expand the franchise's horizons. Fury Road proved to be a monumental event and marked the rousing return of Miller to his most iconic cinematic contributions. Sadly, Furiosa crashed and flamed at the box office in 2024, raising serious doubts about the future of Mad Max and the next planned installment, The Wasteland. But that's for another day. Until then, it's best to slam on the brakes and say, yep, 
that's what the f happened to Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome.